All right, y'all, get ready. Let's do it. It's time for Southeastern Rewinds. Tell me more. I'm David Summers with the Tennessee Stud, Ron Fuller, answering five questions from the latest Studcast now on Ron's new home on YouTube. The five questions on this edition of Tell Me More come from Studcast episode number 20, the 20th original episode. It's called Atlanta's Torch is Lit. Remember to find Southeastern Rewind on YouTube. Subscribe, ring the bell, and then we'll ring your bell when we drop more stories, some of the greatest in history, the history of wrestling on YouTube. And be sure to tell your friends about Southeastern Rewind. Hey, Stud, a lot going on. How you been? What's, what's, what's the latest? Tell us what's happening in the Great Smoky Mountains. Oh, man, it's beautiful. Uh, we got that fall, that first little cold front came through. And it's down there into the 50s at night. And, you know, uh, 75, 80 sometimes during the day. Really, really <laughs> pretty pretty nice temperatures, uh, blue skies, and, and uh, nice crisp air man so can't don't get much better are you sleeping uh, with the window cracked uh not yet but, uh, <laughs> i think i'd have had a blanket last night if i'd have had it cracked. yeah yeah you 50 know? that's in the 50s that's that sounds awesome we're barely in the 60s at night and, and still plenty uh plenty of sweat in the daytime here in southeast alabama but uh, man we wish we were hanging out with you stud oh yeah man this is this is really pretty here and uh leaves are just beginning to to turn a little bit uh gonna just get prettier in the next few weeks awesome that is fantastic all right so listen there are a lot of things going on including what's happening on southeastern rewind on youtube but then you've got a couple of really cool things happening there in knoxville in the not for, for folks in the knoxville area tell us about the dinner with the stud deal that's really cool yeah man uh and you know that that's going to be at the height of the the leaves in this part of the country. And the Smoky Mountains about the middle of October. It's just gorgeous here, and uh, kind of why I picked this first time for the first time frame. You know, uh, uh, fans are really buying tickets from all all over the country, and uh, some of them are trying to make a vacation out of it. Man, it's on it's on a Wednesday night, October the thirteenth, mm -hmm. from seven to nine. It's in downtown Knoxville, basically uh, right there at the University of Tennessee's Neyland Stadium. Yeah. Uh, big, beautiful restaurant, uh, Calhoun's on the River restaurant. Uh, and uh, yeah, up in the banquet, up on top of the roof for, you know, the top story of this three-story uh, restaurant is a banquet. And, uh, so we're going to be in one of those banquet halls. Uh, we're going to... Uh, we're going to uh, give away two free autograph pictures. We're going to give away a free uh, barbecue buffet dinner uh, done by the restaurant, obviously. Uh, and we're going to have some door prizes, a uh, whole lot of things like that. Uh, it's going to be Les Thatcher. We've got a special guest, my cousin Jimmy Golan, uh, going to run over from Maryville, which is not far out of Knoxville. And we're going to... Uh, we're going to greet these people, and uh, we're going to spend two hours with them. We're going to do an hour of a stud cast, and then we're going to do a one-hour question and answer and, and have the audience ask any questions that they want to. Uh, we'll record that and put it on the YouTube. And, heck, those that come and want to ask the question, you may see yourself somewhere. They'll see you around the world, maybe, just asking questions there. So, uh, you know, it's going to be a great event. It's uh, just $30. Uh, heck, uh, and the two autograph pictures we're giving away is a $30 value in itself. So it's like a free dinner and everything else. And, you know, uh, we're really looking forward to it. It's going to be a really remarkable and unforgettable evening, I think, for a whole lot of wrestling fans. We're going to try to do it about every month. Uh, every month, uh, second Wednesday in the month was what we're looking at. And uh, I think, uh, I think uh, hopefully it's going to grow. And get even bigger but uh you know this one's great uh, for just the fact dave that it's uh september the it's the middle of october yeah. october the 13th and uh you know people come in here in this part of the country it's the busiest time of the year for the busiest national park in the country the smoky mountain national park oh heck yeah and listen you you've already sold so i don't know how big the room is the the ballroom or the the, the, the third floor room you're talking about that you're using but you've already sold quite a few tickets. 
So folks can get those and probably should get those as soon as possible. And what is the best way? Do we go to tnstud.com? Because we know we can get them there, right? That's it. You just go to the website, tnstud.com, and uh, they're $30 each. Uh, and you get all that stuff for free. Uh, it's a pretty remarkable deal, I think. And, uh, and I know that the way tickets are going, as you said, people, uh, people if you're interested in getting them, need to go ahead and uh, set it up now. And uh, I really look forward to doing it. Uh, and Southeastern Rewind, obviously, we just put up the USA TV show number five. It went up on Sunday at 3 o'clock Eastern time. There's a new one every week on Sundays at 3 p.m. Eastern. And uh, this is another great one. Uh, it's got uh, got a lot of stars in it again. Uh, got the bullet on this one, actually, in the ring. And, uh, you know, it's got a got – a, it's going to be another one of the great ones, I think. Uh, fans are really, really enjoying these USA shows. Uh, we got that uh, special out there. Fans are free bird fans. They need to see that southeastern sweet spot that we have on there now. That's a cage match between, of all people, Michael Hayes against Terry Gordy, <laughs> his old partner. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, really, really a great piece of video. And, uh, you know, uh, those two guys uh, hook up and they go in. They leave Southeastern and go the following week, take that video with them to Atlanta television. And they're going to throw that thing on, uh, on the big station there. And, uh, wow, they're going to, they're going to stay there and, uh, become partners again. Yeah, so. that's, that's cool. And listen, I saw the Freebirds uh, the, the, the video over the weekend and I, I thought, dude, the, the passion from those two is oozing when they're fighting each other. And then, and then the, the scene at the end in the locker room, yeah, I, I thought it was really a, a kind of a behind the scenes look at, at the, the relationship between those two. So I thought that yeah. was really worthwhile. Yeah, pretty remarkable piece of video, man. Yeah. Uh, really, really remarkable. We're going to do that about every other week. We're going to have a southeastern sweet spot, and uh, and I think the next one is going to be that great block busting uh, gimmick that we did and the angle that we did uh, way way back seventy seven. Uh, with uh, Jola Duke and the Mongolian Stomper, broke those concrete blocks on both their heads. <laughs> I knew it. Uh, <laughs> I knew that. That's if you've got if you've got that on video, that that one is going to go. That one is going to go hard too. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I'm looking to you know, we're going to be uh, searching for some of these great spots, uh, these uh, great highlights from the southeastern days. Yeah. And uh, once a uh, twice a month, we'll have them on there. And uh, they'll all be, you know, they, they won't be nearly as long as a one-hour wrestling show, but uh, they're going to be really action-filled, and they're going to be something extremely interesting for fans. Well, listen, when you talked about that situation and the, the – the, I mean, when you're talking about putting the block on, uh, on uh, Joe's head and then the stomper has the sledgehammer – you know, it was amazing enough when you were talking about it as a stud cast, and so now you're going to put the video to it, and that's uh, that's really going to be cool. All right, stud, yeah. five questions. You ready? I'm ready, my man. All right, let's do it. Daryl Dickens of Montreal, Canada, in the Great White North says, you talked about the French angel born in Russia about the same time as your grandfather Roy Welch was born. Maurice was famous for not only being a great wrestler, but for also being so ugly. Then in Studcast number 156 and number 157, you bring up another ugly wrestler named Dutch Mantel. Which one was the ugliest, in your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> I like this one, man. Wow. <laughs> Daryl's getting us off to a good start here. Oh, wow. You know, uh, Maurice Tillette was the name of the French angel. And uh, mm. wow, I'm telling you, <laughs> that dude was extremely ugly. I mean, <laughs> he might have been one of the ugliest people ever on earth. Wow. You know, and, uh, and you know, and I people should go to Google and go Google him. Uh, Google French angel or Maurice Tillet. Mm -hmm. Either way, you're going to get to look at one of the ugliest men that <laughs> ever lived in the uh, Wow, uh, and, and and I'm sure he scared the heck out of a whole lot of people. Unlike the Stomper, hmm. who looks so vicious and so mean, he's just, he's just so darn ugly, man. That you 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 almost want to turn away and not look at him, you know. Uh, 
And uh, and then they, he, the gentleman here mentions uh, the old original Dutch Mantel, right? Uh, and uh, gosh, uh, I love Dutch Mantel stories. Jeez, man, they, they just uh, I have a hard time keeping myself from telling them, you know, because uh, he's such a pivotal character in wrestling. Uh, and he trained my grandfather to wrestle. Uh, great shooter. And uh, he, you know, uh, uh, he, he broke my grandfather's ribs <laughs> and he broke his wrist. You know, I mean, he tried to kill him before <laughs> before he ever really uh, he taught him how to, how to really wrestle. You know, I mean, he taught him how to shoot, obviously, <laughs> and he didn't mind shooting on him <laughs> when he put the figure four on him and broke his ribs, you know. Uh, but uh, that's poss- probably some of my grandfather's fault because he <laughs> turned in that figure four and uh, he actually had Dutch beat. And uh, Dutch told him in his big accent, he said, uh, I never I never wrestle you no more. <laughs> so <laughs> he said, you ready, you ready, go. <laughs> and he sent him to Columbus, Ohio, of all places, from uh, New Mexico, man, into uh, into Ohio, uh, way back in the 20s, when there was practically, there was one of the first territories in wrestling, uh, was uh, one, one territory in Toledo and one in Columbus, and Roy got sent to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, so, uh, and you know, I got to tell, I, I, like I said, Dave, I, I can't hardly stop myself. from I guess got to tell for fans that may be listening that have never heard this story about how Dutch Mantel became rich in the, uh, in the early 1900s, rich enough to have one of the first model T Fords. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and you had to, and that in those days, uh, I asked Roy one time, "What does a Model T cost?" And he said, "About two hundred dollars." <laughs> wow! Oh. <laughs> and that was a fortune back in those days. And uh, so uh, Dutch used to go into these into these towns, and nobody knew him. And you know, he didn't drive his car. Obviously, he went in there like he was an old cowboy, and he was all beat up. And you know, he would go into the bars about uh, you know five, six o'clock, whatever, you know, fairly early in the evening, he'd get things started and he would get in there and he'd just make a lot of noise, you know, real loud. And, you know, and then he would, he'd have a few drinks and people would think, eh, this guy's kind of, what? he's just a big drunk. And then he would say, you know, I, I want to bet I'm the fastest runner any of you guys ever seen. And he goes, I, I'll take all bets, man. I'll take anybody's bet, whatever amount of money you want. <laughs> and then, you know, you wouldn't get a whole lot of bets. Mm-hmm. You, know, uh, you can't look at a guy and tell how fast he is running. Right. You know, so, and he wasn't big, you know, he, he wasn't a huge guy. So uh, he'd get up a few bets and uh, he'd go out, they'd go out and mark off about a hundred yards, little uh, track there and somebody would say go and he'd run with the guy that was in the saloon that they thought was the fastest guy and he'd lose by 30 yards or so right this was horrible and then he would go back in the bar and everybody then would be like wow this guy's pretty stupid right and then he'd get mouthy again and he would say hey uh, I'm I'm strong I'm real strong you know and uh, I can beat anybody at arm wrestling well when he mm-hmm. we need to lay that on them, uh, mm-hmm. he's, uh, they not only would the ones in the bar bet, but then they would start running out to find their buddies, right? They go, hey, this is <laughs> right. an idiot down here, right? Yeah, yeah. Got an idiot in the saloon, man. And we're all making money off of him. So, uh, so they would show up. Uh, he would wait, you know. He'd wait till the bar got full in the saloon. They were standing out in the street, and uh, and then they would have the uh, the uh, to. You know the old uh, arm 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 wrestling contest, and obviously he'd get beat big time, and then he would get really mad, and he would he would really set them all up big time. Then he would go, oh well, I might have lost at arm wrestling, but I'm a great wrestler. <laughs> and uh, you know now everybody's looking at him. He's small. He can't run. He ain't strong. He didn't beat the. He didn't win the arm wrestling contest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now he's one. And he says, I double the bets. I'll cover you. I'll double all the bets. Yeah. <laughs> I, and, think, uh, I think that was the attraction. He had a pocket full of money. 
he had a pocket full of money and he did right? yeah I mean, he had a, yeah. a whole lot of money when he went there you he know? definitely but had their intention his old yeah. horse and nobody thought he had a dollar and then he would he would say i'm gonna double the bets i'll double whatever you get and oh he said he told roy he said he said the saloon would empty they would all go running there. They tell everybody in town. He said, then they'd have a 300, 400 people piled out there, and he's going to cover all the bets, man. And uh, so then they go out in the in the road, which is just dirt back in those days, and they would uh, they all make a circle around him, and uh, he would go at it with the toughest guy in town. And uh, <laughs> Roy said. Uh, as Roy said, how long will them things mat those matches last? And he said, about 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He said yeah. he'd hook one man and he said you could hear him scream the next town, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. He said it was all over real, real fast. He said he'd collect every dollar in town, man, <laughs> get on his horse and ride to the next town. Wow. <laughs> so gosh, uh, what a what a character, man! The original Dutch Mantel was, and I don't want anybody uh, con you know, uh, <laughs> confuse this with the the now the Dutch Mantel, the old Harry Dutch Mantel, yeah, man, that, right. uh, that everybody knows as Dutch Mantel. But uh, you know, Dutch was he was right up there with the French Angel. The original Dutch Mantel was right up there with the French Angel when it came to ugly. I mean. Uh, I got his pictures on on these. The guy mentioned number one fifty six and one fifty seven, uh, episode one fifty six and one fifty seven is pretty much all Dutch Mantel, and there's two pictures of him there. <laughs> wow, mm. uh, he, he's he's running a real close race with old Maurice. I can tell you the French Angel, but uh, I, I really have to admit uh, uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name. Daryl, I think Daryl. I got to admit though. Uh, in my opinion, if you look at both these guys on <laughs> on Google, you Google them both. Uh, uh, I believe you're going to agree with me that the French Angel has got the he's got uh, the ticket. Listen, you've got to stop telling people to do that because I'm not going to get any sleep tonight. I just looked up Maurice. Oh, <laughs> what do you think? Oh do you think, my Dave? God! Holy, <laughs> was he ever? Was he ever in movies? Was he ever in <laughs> horror know, movies? Hey, oh, oh gosh, he, yeah, he was he was just grotesque. I mean, wow. uh, that's that's unbelievable. I mean that that's an uh, that's ugly. That's and it, actually it's more than ugly. So okay, you uh, you were you weren't lying about that. Good God, I'm a <laughs> well, I, I didn't think so, man. Uh, yeah, and I, I encourage people to go look. I yeah. mean, you you won't really appreciate. Appreciate oh this no! Until you go oh, look oh, at these absolutely, two and the and the, from the from the movie, the uh, uh, I guess you would say animatron movie the, with the ogre. Uh, yeah, I think I think that maybe they they he's modeled after that. So yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he he's he's very similar to the French Angel. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the so the ogre is modeled after after Maurice, or so somebody might have done some re, uh, some hellacious ugly research on that. Yeah, Woo. really ugly. Lord research. have mercy. All right, number two, Alfred Combs, New York City, says, you spoke in this episode about Louis Tillette. I, I, was, I was curious if he's... Uh, yeah, that's crazy, yeah, isn't it? I mean, is he related? <laughs> this guy's a guy. There's another Tillette. What's the chances okay. of that? <laughs> so, but not related. Okay. But you, you spoke in this episode about Louis Tillette and his booking for you in 1979. You said he found Hulk Hogan. What does that mean? And where did he find him? Well, you know, that's crazy in a way, uh, you know, and I can, I can understand, uh, uh, you know, uh, as a wrestler and uh, being in the business, you know, and, uh, and, and yeah, how, how did you find him? Well, uh, it, it's a little more to it than that. Uh, and I think this was Alfred. Alfred, it's a little more to it than that. Uh, you know, uh, Hulk Hogan grew up in Tampa, Florida. And uh, that was his home, and he was a big old guy, obviously. And he, he certainly had the size, but he 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 didn't have great skills. And he went uh, mistakenly. Uh, he he went to, to the uh, snake pit <laughs> mm. Mm. to uh, to have a tryout, and mm. uh, 
you know, uh, it depended on, you know, kind of what kind of guys came in there and what their attitudes was uh, as to how bad they got hurt when they came into the snake pit. And uh, I, I, I got a feeling that uh, old Hulk there, you know, Terry Bolio was his real name. Mm -hmm. Terry was probably a little bit cocky in a way. And, uh, and he went in and, uh, and he, he got paired up with uh, Hiro Matsuda. And uh, Hiro Matsuda was a, another great shooter. Wow. One of the best Japanese, toughest Japanese that ever lived. And uh, he lived in Tampa. That was his home uh, for the last 20, 30 years of his life, I guess. And uh, so uh, they, Matsuda didn't like his attitude. Something about, something must have happened there that Matsuda got a little upset about. And Matsuda broke his leg. Hmm. And, uh, hmm. and on purpose. Wow. And, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and then, uh, obviously he left and they probably hobbled out of there and he wasn't the first to hobble out of the snake pit, you know, and he probably wasn't the last either. But, uh, anyway, he, he left and, uh, and then he came back, you know, and that's, that was really the, the key to my grandfather. We talked about just earlier about, the. Uh, uh, Dutch Mantel uh, that taught him how to how to shoot, yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, my dad, my granddad got his his ribs broke, and he could come come back, and he came back the second time, and uh, that's when uh, Dutch Mantel decided, well, this guy's going to be a wrestler. You know, I, I, he, he he quit hurting him at that point, and uh, so so uh, Hogan then uh, you know came back and when he came back uh, they didn't hurt him the second time but they didn't want to use him for whatever reason uh, they didn't see his talent or his potential and uh, they called up Louis Tillette who was booking for me in 1979 I was in the middle of the war for Knoxville mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was at home and uh, trying to uh, win obviously win the war and uh, keep my territory alive. And so I had Louis Tillette booking for me in Southeastern down there in Pensacola. And he got a call from the Tampa office and they said, Louis, we got this great big, huge guy. He's probably a uh, six, nine and he weighs about 300 plus. And, uh, you know, would you like to give him a shot? And, uh, you know, Louis was looking for some different type of talent and, uh, you know, we had had a great crew there in 78, me and Bob Armstrong and David Schultz and uh, the Assassins, uh, uh, great, great talent there. And uh, so uh, Louis was trying to follow that talent. And so he he says, yeah, send him to me. So uh, that's Alfred is how that that's how Hulk Hogan got to end up in Southeastern. And that's where he really got his start. Uh and in fact, uh, I flew in there on my birthday uh, in 1979 and uh, wrestled him uh, in one of his first matches in Southeastern. I went in to, uh, to put him over because he was going to, they were going to try to make a star out of him. And uh, so that's kind of the, the history of Southeastern and Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan got a start there, uh, stayed there for probably a year, close to a year before he moved on to another territory and uh, became pretty close friends with him. As a matter of fact, uh, he was a good guy. All right, cool deal. And so that's kind of the beginning story about Hulk Hogan. All right, stud, here we go to question number three from David Mooney, Macon, Georgia. David says you spoke about TV stations and wrestling on live TV shows back in Georgia during your father's time in 1964 how many tv shows would they wrestle in a day and where were they did that change by the time you and robert started in 1970 well on, on this particular episode i think i probably explained why you were having to have live television uh and, and back in the 60s even in the 50s you had to do your uh there was no tape. There was no videotape and uh, no way to tape shows. So if you had a fairly large territory, and Georgia was a fairly large territory, you had sometimes three or four different cities that had their own TV stations, and you had to send wrestlers to all those stations always on a Saturday. 
because that happened to be that he was very popular uh, during the daytime or at night. Uh, in some territories, they, they had more TVs than that. Uh, probably in the ter Tennessee Territory, out of Nashville, they might have had as many as seven TVs, probably, live TVs that they had to send wrestlers to. So uh, I think your question was, uh, how many TV shows uh, would you wrestle on in a day, and where were they? And we're talking about Georgia here, because that was the, uh, the subject of this particular uh, episode 20, the original studcast. And uh, so uh, in 1964, I think was the year you said uh, there were mm -hmm. there at least three TV stations. Uh, you know, I wouldn't go into them back then because I was still in high school. But uh, there was a you had TV in Atlanta uh, and you had a television station that you were on in Columbus and Macon had its own television station. So there were times on a Saturday, some wrestlers. If you were unlucky enough to get these, you would end up wrestling four times on a Saturday. <laughs> yeah, because the TV stations, uh, the shows were all staggered around, and the, and the shows were live mm -hmm. because they not only didn't have the ability to tape them and send them out, they didn't have the ability to tape them at all. Well, so, right, you know, right. So you had a morning show. In Columbus, as an example, and you had an afternoon, early afternoon show in Macon, and then you had an Atlanta TV late Saturday afternoon. And all of these and were live. All of them were live. Starting in the morning so, time, yeah, in different towns, of course. Go. Yeah. So yeah. you get up in Atlanta, if you were a wrestler, and you lived in Atlanta, and you had all three TVs. You busted your butt down there to Columbus, which is about a two hour ride. You wrestled on that TV. You jumped in your car. You went uh, probably 75 miles uh, over to Macon, and you wrestled on that TV, and then you jumped in the car and went an hour and a half back toward Atlanta, and uh, you went to, you wrestled in Atlanta TV, and then you wrestled that night in a live event. So, <laughs> so you know, uh, uh, Saturdays were busy days for wrestlers back in those times, and you had to have a pretty large crew just to be able to to have enough guys to to do all those TVs. Mm. Wow! So, uh, it was a it was a struggle, and and I think you mentioned something about when me and Rob came along. Well, when we came along, uh, it was the same deal. There still in '70, there were very few places that were had figured out uh, how to tape to get their shows taped and one of them was one territory was florida florida was taping shows in 1970 one of the first territories probably in the world to tape one show and then they would put it on a videotape a big old two inch tape that was wow about 40 pounds uh to to pick up uh and uh they would throw them on those big old tape machines those tape machines were just huge and that big old two inch tape rolling around on that sucker man. Uh, and they would, uh, they would tape for markets and then they would bicycle that tape around and, uh, they were way ahead of time. They were ahead of Georgia for sure in 1970, but mm -hmm. uh, right around 1970, 71, all that changed because videotape became the thing in television stations. Yep. You no longer had to do those live TV shows. And uh, you didn't have to do a whole bunch of TVs if you had a big territory. So you just did one show and you bicycle that thing around to all your towns. And that's kind of how it worked. Uh, I think your name was David. Uh, David, that's kind of how it worked. And me and Rob, uh, we kind of did several times. We did those three, four shows a day mm. on that Saturday. Worked three or four times on a Saturday because you were on all those TVs. And uh, you really didn't have any choice. Mm. Did your dad wake you up on Sunday and make you make you chop wood? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, As what a have you? In fact, he probably yeah. did, man. What? What have you, boys? Was horrible, yeah. you know. He yeah. didn't care. I mean, heck, he was doing them too. He was he was still a star. Yeah. He was still working those TVs like we were, and uh, yeah, my dad was a he pushed people, yeah. man. And he yeah. was he was horrible to live with. I mean, yeah. you didn't you you didn't get any party time with dad. Yeah, no, he wasn't going to let you kids waste a weekend. Nah, no way. Oh, hell no, man. You know, <laughs> hey, we got some wood out here, man. Look, I'm going to cut down that tree right there, man. And we'll, That's we'll, it. 
We'll, we'll get to hacking yeah, on. Yeah. Bring the axes. Here we go. Yeah, you fought four times yesterday. Shut up. Get over there and yeah. chop wood, boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was never enough for him. There you go. All right, number four, Jeffrey Talmage, Talmage, T- uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. He says wrestling magazines came up in this particular episode. He says, I heard that you were not fond of those and would not allow writers to come into your territories to cover your wrestlers. Is that true? And if so, why? And that's a good question. Because yeah, it's, a, it's back, a really good question. Jeffrey. Back then, yeah. as I recall, you, we didn't have that many magazines, but we could learn about what was happening in other towns. But in, anyway, go. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. The wrestling magazines were not plentiful. There right. weren't a lot of different ones being published, mm-hmm. but they were pretty darn popular, and they gave people around the country an opportunity to see what was going on in other parts of the country. Uh, I, I I used to get a lot of publicity. St. Louis was one of the it was one of the huge biggest uh, cities that you could wrestle in. The most famous, uh, the National Wrestling Alliance president uh, Sam Muchnick lived there, and uh, you know wrestling magazines were plentiful there. I mean, wrestling writers every time you worked St. Louis, which was every other Saturday night for about eight months of the year, that uh, you would go in there and. And they would be taking pictures. They want want to take pictures. They would want to do these stories. And a lot of times, the stories didn't match what the match was. And uh, and I used to see the stories about me. And uh, I remember one story between me and Terry Funk. We'd had a match there, and there was a lot of pictures in the wrestling magazine about it. And it showed uh, Terry Funk all bent over and selling. And it and it said that. It said that I hit him with a low shot, right? And I was like, well, wait a minute now. I think it was just the opposite in that match. If it was a low shot, Terry Funk hit me with the low shot. You know, so uh, guys were kind of writing the stories uh, to fit the pictures. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I got to where I didn't, uh, I didn't really uh, – want a whole lot of wrestling magazine guys, uh, writers to come in there because I wanted them to write realistically what was happening rather than what pictures they took and making up stories about what, what, what like really happened. If you're going to cover the match, cover the match. Yeah. Yeah. Truthfully. Yeah. Honestly, and, and not just know, based and, uh, on a couple of photos. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what was happening with these wrestling magazines and they were going out all over the country and then, you know, I was a baby face and uh, I had never healed at that point. And I, I didn't want to be portrayed as being a heel in other parts of the country. And uh, they were making me look like I was a heel everywhere those magazines were going. So, uh, so I, I kind of got a, a bad taste in my mouth for wrestling magazines about 1972, 73, 74, when I, I really started to get a push. Uh, in Florida, and then an even bigger push in St. Louis. So, you know, uh, and I, that, that's, that's my story, Jeffrey. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, you know, and it was kind of true <laughs> that I didn't really encourage wrestling writers, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, wrestling magazine writers to, to come to my territory very much. Hmm. And uh, that's kind of the reason for it. All right. So we go to question number five, Alan Burkstar, Seattle, Washington. Dude, I'm telling you, we've been corner to corner of this great nation today. How can you remember so many wrestlers and so many stories and keep them all straight? You even have great hockey stories. Where do you store all of that in your head? (laughs) Well, Okay, is is it all in that noggin, and does your head hurt a lot? <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> that's that's good, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good one there. Uh, I'll tell you, I don't know really how it all works, Alan. I'll be honest with you, man. I mean, there's a whole lot of lot of stuff in there, you know, that's for sure. And uh, and you know, this is a great example. This show that we do here, this Tell Me More show, it's a great example. I mean, I think by the time you know we've got the 20 episodes here on the Studcast, you got 20 hours in. Uh, now we're at 200, right? <laughs> 215 mm-hmm. or 16 yep. somewhere in yep. there. Dave and uh, 
You know, that's what's that? Uh, 2000. I mean, I, I don't even know how many of the hours that is. And uh, every one of those shows has facts and, and things that I can remember. And, and then we get to this and we're going back and kind of doing it again uh, and, and telling you more. I mean, it requires that, you know, I kind of have I, I tried to tell different stories than what I had stole, told the first time. And uh, well, Dave. It, it, I, they still keep coming, you know, I mean, they're unlimited. I don't know how many I got in there, but Alan, though, you know, uh, uh, and then probably I don't keep them all straight sometimes. And I've probably told uh, several of them several times. So, uh, and the, and the hockey part of it, that's easy for me because it's totally different than wrestling. I mean, that's a different part of my brain, I guess. You know, <laughs> hockey stories come from somewhere else, you know, mm. and, uh, so, uh, you know, and then I guess it's all stored in there somehow, you know, and uh, I don't get uh, too messed up on it too often, uh, but occasionally I do. I, I kind of lose my train of thought sometimes because I got another idea, <laughs> another story that pops in my head while I'm telling one, you know, so, uh, uh, but it's a great, great, <laughs> it's a great question here, man. And, uh, you know, I, and I really don't know how to explain it, but uh, that's about the best I can do. Well, I, I got to tell y'all, this, this is a true story. One time I was hanging out with the stud. We were at his house. I dropped a pack of um, toothpicks and they spilled on the floor. And immediately he said 487. <laughs> and then he, then he started saying Wapner, Wapner, Wapner. I'd never seen anything like it. Never seen anything like it. That's awesome. All right, listen, before we split today, and that's another fun time today, let's talk about Dinner with the Stud that's going to be happening in Knoxville about mid-October, a perfect time of season. Yes, it is. Uh, October 13th, to be exact, uh, 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock. We're going to be recording. We're going to be telling stories. We're going to do a stud cast. We're going to answer questions. Uh, we're going to shake hands with every person that comes, uh, you know, uh, and uh, it, it's just going to be a wonderful evening. I mean, I've been looking for things to do, Dave, to special, something different to make my fans happy and uh, to give them as much as I can. And uh, wow, this one I really like. I hope it's going to be successful. Hope we can continue to do it, but uh, please join me uh, October 13th. If you're somewhere in that Knoxville area, one of the great restaurants in America, when you get into that restaurant, you're going to freak out. You're going to go, <laughs> wow, this is unbelievable. And uh, that's where we're going to be. eating. That's awesome. And it's on me by golly. Heck yeah. Can't miss that. All right, there it is, folks. Another Southeastern Rewind. Tell me more where the Tennessee stud Ron Fuller answered five questions about studcast number 20, which is now on Ron's new home on YouTube. Remember to find Southeastern Rewind on YouTube. Subscribe, ring the bell to get reminders on when the greatest stories in wrestling will be dropped on YouTube. And be sure to tell your friends about Southeastern Rewind. For Ron Fuller, I'm David Summers. We'll see you next time on another Tell Me More.